Don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment, and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you're too arrogant. And if you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. Oh, tap. This is Femi, here with Freedom Now. And your ears are in tuned at high frequencies in a liberated zone. Freedom Now is a pan-Africanist, global news outlet from coast to coast, dispelling the Western propaganda media and their all-lies point of views. Freedom Now is devoted to relay true news, views, and proper clues to form solutions around freedom for the oppressed worldwide. Now, get relaxed, grab a pen, and phone a friend, because Freedom Now is set to begin to awaken deep sleepers dreaming about Freedom Now within in Freedom Now in. Habarigani. This is Sister Thage with Freedom Now's agenda for this fun drive Saturday, April 20th, 2024. We commence with our sister, Luyanda Kuboka, in the African Drumbeat historical calendar. Then, we'll hear from our Pacific Islander, Papua New Guinea, and Maori community members. First, our Los Angeles-based sister, Nikki Okuk. She's the daughter of the late Papuan independence leader, Yambake Okuk, and she sends out a response as recently U.S. President Joe Biden's racist and dehumanization campaign to call our Melanesian family cannibals to justify stealing their land and gold is met with resistance. And we'll also update our listeners on colonizers in Aotearoa, New Zealand, who are dangerously turning to the far right in their government. But the resistance from the Tapati Maori Indigenous Peoples Political Party, their member, Debbie Ngoare, shares what is happening with the settlers trying to violate treaties for indigenous rights and to fast track any environmental protections, leaving all of it across New Zealand just into the hands of three people. We must keep our Freedom Now listeners informed on our international solidarity against these oppressive imperialist settler colonial governments. This hour, prolific author, radical historian, professor of African American Studies at the University of Houston, and Freedom Now co-producer, Dr. Gerald Horn interviews, Dr. Shannon Eads, assistant professor of history at the College of Charleston in South Carolina, here to discuss her book, Sexual Violence and American Slavery, The Making of a Rape Culture in the Antebellum South. We are in Fun Drive, so we need your support this hour with your pledges to keep Freedom Now on the air. The number to call is 818-985-KPFK. That's 818-985-5735. Our music clip mix includes MLK, Zap Mama, McCoy Tyner, John Coltrane, Alice Coltrane, Amina Figueroa, Prison Radio Commentaries, and more. So sit back, phone a friend, and as always, we stand... Ready for revolution. Afro-American. What is an Afro-American? And we need to come clean. What is an Afro-American? Is it an American with an Afro? And we live in California. Wouldn't it be more proper to say Jerry Curl American? How about this African-American thing? People say, oh, now he got the right name. No, wait a minute, we got to think about this. I always struggle with people. I have a shirt that says, we are Africans, period. Not African-American, but people say, yeah, but you know, my ancestry is African, but I was born in America, therefore I'm African-American. We tell them they haven't read Malcolm X. Malcolm X said if a cat had kittens in the oven, you don't call them biscuits. I 
Lafia. This is Sister Luyanda Koboka with Freedom Now's African Drumbeat Historical Calendar for the week of April 18th. Our weekly review of significant revolutionary events and personalities within the African and the internationalist world is our small effort to educate our listening audience with a mass view of history. We seek to keep the fire of the struggle for a better world burning during a period of imposed pessimism by the European media and their government handlers. And by calling out our revolutionary ancestors and their deeds, we give them immortality. April 18, 1980. Zimbabwe seizes independence under the leadership of the Patriotic Front, a united front of ZANU, the Zimbabwean African Nationalist Union, headed by the present Prime Minister Robert Mugabe and ZAPU. Zimbabwe's African People's Union, headed by Joshua Nkomo. April 19, 1960. SWAPO, the leading liberation movement of Namibia, formerly Southwest Africa, was founded. SWAPO was and is the primary representative of the people of Namibia who fought not only the settler racist regime of Southwest Africa, but also fought against the apartheid regime of South Africa. April 21, 1895. Sanpia, a Comanche Native American, was born. She was torn between a mother who wanted her to follow the traditional Indian herbalist and a father who wanted her to follow the white man's ways. By the 1940s, she was the Comanche's only surviving eagle doctor, a shaman who gets her power from the eagle. April 22, 1948. Zionists seize Haifa from Palestinians' National Resistance Forces beginning the mass European Jewish exodus from their European homeland into Palestine and the setting up of the illegal settler colony of Israel. April 22, 1794. Maria Trinidad Sanchez was born. She was a leading organizer against Spanish colonial rule and for the independence of the Dominican Republic. She created the first handmade flag of independence and was opposed to the first president of the independent country, Pedro Santan, for his cruelty. He ordered her executed on the first anniversary of the founding of the Republic. April 23, 1828. Shaga, the great Zulu warrior, and a major force in the unification of Southern Africa in resistance against British colonial forces crosses to the ancestor world. April 23, 1975. Vietnam, a peasant agricultural country, after more than 40 years of armed war against the United States' efforts at colonialism and division, defeats U.S. imperialism and unites Vietnam, thereby proving the adage, the power of the people is greater than the white man's technology. April 24th, 1965. U.S. President Johnson orders the invasion of Santo Domingo, where 42,000 U.S. troops crushed a popular mass uprising against a U.S.-backed, non-democratic, corrupt regime. This has been Sister Luyanda here on KPFK 90.7 FM in Southern California and 98.7 FM in Santa Barbara and streaming live on the web at kpfk.org. Past agendas and music of Freedom Now can be reviewed at kpfk.org. Go to Programs and scroll to Freedom Now for any comments and questions. Our email is freedomnow at kpfk.org. Please join us in a unity chant of Amandla Awe, to which means the power of society, the power of social existence is ours, we the people. Amandla Awe to Amandla Awe to Amandla Awe to For KPFK, Pacifica Radio, this is Gerald Horn for Freedom Now, urging you to go to our secure website, 
at kpfk.org and make a secure pledge to make sure that the valuable information that you receive on a weekly basis on Freedom Now continues. Where else but Freedom Now can you receive detailed information on the struggle for reparations of descendants of enslaved Africans or the prison industrial complex or the continuing horrid legacy of enslavement or the glories of victories over white supremacy and colonialism and imperialism. Where else but Freedom Now do you get such information along with the hippest music mix in North America, including the work of John Coltrane, Alice Coltrane, Farrell Sanders, McCoy Tyner, Regina Carter, and Esperanza Spaulding, amongst others. At Freedom Now, we take special pride in our programming concerning Black women's struggles in particular, making us unique on the airwaves. So pick up the phone and dial. 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-KPFK. And now we go to our sister, Nikki Okuk, daughter of the late Papua New Guinea independence leader, Mbake Okuk, giving her response to Biden's recent racist and dehumanizing comments on our Papua New Guinea family, calling them cannibals. So Papua New Guinea made the news again today because President Biden called us, you guessed it, cannibals. So this has happened to me so many times. I mean, mostly in the United States, people say they just don't even know where the place is. But if they do know where the place is, they then immediately ask if I'm a cannibal. Um, So I want to say something, though, sort of important here, which is that this practice of constantly referring to Papua New Guineans as cannibals is part of an overall structure that um, is used to just sort of dehumanize the other, right? And when you can make us less than human, then you can do almost anything to us, right? Which explains a lot about why the U.S. brokered the deal that gave West Papua over to the Indonesians. And it still continues to be occupied today. And most recently, an incredibly horrific video of torture came out of West Papua, demonstrating exactly what the Indonesian military has been committing against the people of West Papua for my entire lifetime. And um, while we try to raise the issue of human rights abuses in West Papua in order to say that humans are being abused there and human rights are being abused there, you would have to view us as human. And um, we know that the Indonesian occupation of West Papua is premised on um, our inhumanity. When I was there, I read all sorts of propaganda where Indonesians were telling folks to transmigrate there and help bring the monkeys down out of the trees, right? So it's deeply rooted in anti-Blackness and racism, uh, perpetuating colonial structures, but all for what end goal, right? The end goal is always money. And it's because West Papua is home to the largest gold mine in the world and is Indonesia's largest taxpayer. So in order for Indonesia to lay claim, um, backed by U.S. and the other world powers, right, this is a U.S. owned mine, uh, the Indonesian military continues to be armed by the U.S., they have to dehumanize us. And, and I haven't been posting a lot just because I'm also, you know, I think like the rest of us sort of processing the the dehumanization of the Palestinian people and watching as, um, you know, they are being called terrorists while their children are being slaughtered in front of our eyes. And um, free West Papua, free Palestine. And continuing in the Pacific, we'll now hear from Aotearoa, Tapati Maori political party, Representative Debbie Nguare, speaking on the settler colonial fast track bill to violate their treaties and roll back environmental protections to destroy the seabeds for mining. Kia ora whanau. I want to kōrero with you about the fast track approval bill. 
um, and what it means. It's a shocking piece of legislation currently being proposed by this government that will hugely adversely affect our Tariti, our Taiao, our Moana and our Whanau. It's been designed to give the government superpowers to fast track consent for big projects which may affect our environment but bring in profit. If it gets through, what it means is that activities like seabed mining, which have previously been turned down, or all companies that were in Wahitapu waterways, mining on Maunga, can get in. The Fast Track Bill intends to override all existing environmental protection, te tariti and cultural kaupapa. The Fast Track Bill appoints an expert review panel, who by the way, are chosen by this man, the Minister of Infrastructure, and it's the expert review panel's role to collect all information on projects, talk to local councils, iwi, government officials, departments, and make recommendations whether to go ahead or not. However, this guy can override the expert panel who may have decided no and say yes anyway. Worse, there's not a thing we can do as the expert panel is explicitly directed it doesn't need to consult with the public hapu manawata whenua. So one minister has all the power. And be clear, we will not know what's happening in our tile until it's public. But we do need to all participate and show our strong objection to what has been proposed by this government. Toi tu te tiriti whanau. Let's get in there and show them what we're made of. Kia ora rā. Māori leaders are concerned the government plan to fast track consents doesn't take treaty obligations into account. The aim of the Fast Track Approvals Bill is to speed up consents for major development and infrastructure projects considered to have regional or even national benefits. Consent requirements can be bypassed and even projects that have previously been declined by the courts are eligible to apply. It's been described as a dictatorship and that it'll have grand repercussions for iwi. Three ministers will have final approval. Projects of concern include Trans-Tasman Resources bid to launch an offshore mining project near Taranaki. At issue is the absence of a Treaty of Waitangi Clause or protections for iwi who are yet to reach a treaty settlement. Māori Affairs correspondent Te Aniwa Hurihanganui reports. Seabed mining off the South Taranaki coast could one day look like this. Trans-Tasman Resources has been fighting for consent to suck up millions of tonnes of iron sand from these waters for years. And under the Fast Track Approval Bill, it might soon be possible. The proposed Fast Track Bill is um, disproportionately pro-development. It's constitutionally flawed. Uh, it con concentrates power in three ministers and unfortunately has grand repercussions for hapu and iwi customary rights. It's the government's solution to speed up the consents process, which costs over a billion dollars a year. With this legislation, mining will be turbocharged. But many Māori say there's a glaring omission. There is no tetiriti principles clause at all. The bone chilling part of it is it excludes hapu and iwi from having a substantive role. Iwi around the country are demanding to know why. Ngāti Ruanui calling the bill a dictatorship at its worst, while Waikato and Ngaitahu are concerned it will breach their treaty rights. There is a, a treaty clause in the bill in the sense that it protects and upholds um, our our national party commitment but also our coalition government commitment to uphold and protect Treaty of Waitangi settlements. But many treaty settlements have been completed in the context of the Resource Management Act, legislation that contains multiple protections for Māori. Te Aniwa Hurihanganui, One News. For KPFK Pacifica Radio, this is Gerald Horn for Freedom Now. Urging you to go to our secure website at kpfk.org and make a secure pledge to make sure that the valuable information that you receive on a weekly basis on Freedom Now continues. Where else but Freedom Now can you receive detailed information on the struggle for reparations of descendants of enslaved Africans or the prison industrial complex, or the continuing hard legacy of enslavement, or the glories of victories over white supremacy and colonialism and imperialism. Where else but freedom now do you get such information along with the hippest music mix in North America, including the work of 
John Coltrane, Alice Coltrane, Farrell Sanders, McCoy Tyner, Regina Carter, and Esperanza Spaulding, amongst others. At Freedom Now, we take special pride in our programming concerning Black women's struggles in particular, making us unique on the airwaves. So pick up the phone and dial. 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-KPFK. For Pacifica Radio, KPFK Los Angeles, this is Gerald Horn. And with me on the line is Shannon C. Eves, Assistant Professor of History at the College of Charleston in South Carolina and author of the book, Sexual Violence and American Slavery, The Making of a Rape Culture in the Antebellum South. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Professor Eves. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to this conversation. Ditto. So why did you write this book? I wrote this book because I knew that there were there was an important story here to, to tell. You know, I'm I'm not the first person to write about enslaved women and sexual violence. But as I began doing this research on enslaved women and sexual violence, I began to see how the pervasiveness of sexual violence in the antebellum South was a story of not just enslaved women, but it was a story that involved the people who perpetrated these crimes, as well as the people who witnessed these crimes, and the people who faced consequences of these actions. And and I and I said the word crime, and and I, I should I should clarify in saying that though this was definitely a crime against humanity, it wasn't something that was considered to be against the law. And so that, that again speaks to how pervasive rape and sexual violence was. It was very much a tool of power that not only in slaveholders, but also the people who did their dirty work, their, their agents, the people who the entire system of slavery empowered, slave patrollers, overseers, they are also able to tap into um, the use of rape and sexual violence as a tool of power to subjugate Black people to white people um, in, in with, within these enslaved, within this slave society. And so I, I wanted to be able to tell, tell that, tell that story, that story that placed slaveholders and enslavers and enslaved people side by side and, and thinking about how they maneuvered one another, how they how they had to navigate space um, during during this time period. And you know one of the you know one of the things that I emphasize is that, you know, as you said, um, you know, as I said in the very beginning, the story does foreground the sexual violence of enslaved women. And I and I want, you know, the the audience as well as the readers of the book to understand that, you know, this is not a culture where only enslaved women, you know, are are victims of sexual violence. But this is a system where the sexual violence of enslaved women is foundational. It is it is foundational to the upkeep of the system of slavery. It is foundational to the perpetuation of the the system of slavery through their reproductive exploitation. And and again, and it is a way to instill instill fear in and terror within within all members of the enslaved community. And um, and so that you know that's that's the important intervention that I think that this book is making is that it is looking at the South in its totality and it is giving you a spotlight on enslavers, um, enslaved, um, 
slaveholding men as well as slaveholding women, as well as the experiences of enslaved women and enslaved men. Mm -hmm. Now, you referenced the category in your book of sexual servants. What does that mean? So one of the, um, one of the the aspects of in, of sexual violence against enslaved women that you know many historians have talked about is uh, is what historically was referred to as concubinage, and this references the the long term sexual liaisons that existed between enslaved women and enslaved men, and there's ways in which you know, the society even then, but even society in the present has looked on the past and, you know, there's been effort, efforts to, you know, romanticize these relationships that it was possible for, ensl for enslavers to actually have potentially, you know, romantic feelings for enslaved women and that the result of, you know, these long-term sexual liaisons um, were children and, you know, for some, there was something that could could be something akin to even like a pseudo marriage. And so I, I implore the use sexual servant not to not to dispel that, to dispel the idea that enslavers did have long term liaisons with enslaved women. We do know that to be true. Enslaved people in their own testimony talk about the fact that enslaved women, you know, did find themselves in long-term liaisons um, with their enslavers producing multiple children. You know, they talk about the fact that these women were often receivers of trinkets and gifts and even promises of freedom. The historical record, you know, shows instances where these enslaved women, you know, are able to garner freedom for themselves as well as the children that they hold, that they have by their slave owners. But I, so, but for me, the calling these, calling these women concubines in some ways to me obscures the, the power dynamic that is really, that's, that really exists between the, these enslaved women and their enslavers. For every enslaved woman who does manage to get a trinket, there's or a gift or you know some sort of monetary gain, there's so many more who never do. For each of these women, for each woman who's able to garner freedom for herself and her children, there are so many more who never do. There's there's ways in which even these promises for freedom um, can be very fleeting, and. And so I, I, I use the term sexual servant to describe these women because in so many instances, sexual, you know, sexual acts were quite literally a part of their, their responsibility, their labor responsibility as enslaved, as enslaved people. We, you know, we, there's, there's so much evidence of slave slave owning men going out and purchasing women for this exact purpose you know they they purchase these women for the purpose of engaging in sexual relations with them and if these women resist there is a consequence often for that resistance and so sexual relations becomes a part of their their labor responsibility it, it is their it is their labor to keep house for these men to cook for them to share a bed with them to bear children by them this is all wrapped up into their servitude and again there were often consequences for refusing to do this and and so often what you know people have placed emphasis on are perhaps the the benefits you know the things that were that have been perceived as benefits but i thought that it was important to really truly contextualize this to really contextualize it and to never lose sight of the fact that again 
that the power dynamic here is was always between that of an enslaver and the person that they enslaved and that we do see we do see instances that you know when that they're that when these enslaved women you know are trying perhaps to make good on some of these promises that slave owners have made to them in exchange for their sexual labor you know that's when we really see that power dynamic in you know really truly come to light you know i i've you know finding historical records of enslaved women finding themselves in slave trading yards and you know reminding their enslaver of those promises and and quickly being faced with the reality that none of that really mattered that ultimately their enslavers prerogative to sell them you know is 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 what ended up you know having the last word and um and, and so many of them you know did it did you know have you know fates that that i think concubinage you know as a term and concubine as a term you know doesn't really fully capture mhm talk to us about the phrase forced coupling so in order for the the system of slavery to to grow in the United States enslavers had to look to their enslaved people to to reproduce an enslaved labor force through sexual reproduction and you know we see this we see this um happen in the United States in a way that's quite different from other parts of of the Americas when we when we think about African slavery in the Americas more broadly you know in in other parts of the world like Brazil and you know other parts of the Caribbean um you know Cuba Puerto Rico you know people are continuing to just import people you know African slaves in you know by the hundreds of thousands you know year after year after year but in the United States when the transatlantic slave trade is abolished in 1808 you know this is actually coinciding with the growth of slavery in the in the US you know as as the country acquires you know new territories and the the possibilities for economic growth you know with particularly with the emergence of of cotton um present itself to people you know more and more people are looking to enter into slaveholding as as a way of life and a way to make money and and so they have to look to the enslaved population themselves because they they're not able to engage in the importation of an enslaved labor force enslaved people are 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 quite literally forced to sexually reproduce in order to in order to perpetuate um this labor force and so enslaved people you know in their testimony talk about how you know when they reach a certain age when they reach sexual maturation their 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 owners you know men and women you know are are coming to them and demanding that they that they couple demanding that they find that they find partners to engage you know to to create you know to create relationship with but most importantly to engage in sexual relations and with you know the hope obviously being that they would produce that that these women would produce children and so you know in that regard you know you know many slave owners you know left left courtship um to a large extent up to the enslaved you know but there but the mandate the mandate was there the mandate was that they that you know you can choose your partner but you have to choose a partner and if you don't i will find one for you and so you know that's that's what i'm referring to when i talk about forced coupling um forcing men and women sometimes you know sometimes against against their will even you know i i've read instances of enslaved men and women talking about being forced 
to have sexual relations in front of their enslavers to show evidence that they are having sexual that they are having sexual intercourse um that you know their enslavers of course will you know hope will result in a pregnancy and eventually the birth of a child hmm. you also refer at one point to the concept of beauty as a liability in so far as it would draw the lustful attention of an enslaver and i'm wondering did you encounter any evidence of women disfiguring themselves to make themselves less physically attractive you know i i personally did not find any evidence of of enslaved women disfiguring themselves but i i did find enslaved women talking about you know trying to hide themselves in plain sight if if that makes sense you know not being very mindful of the ways in which they move their bodies you know not wanting to catch the attention of enslavers not wanting to do anything that could perhaps be seen as seductive and you know and this is a this is a society that already hypersexualized women of african descent that perpetuated myths of black women's hypersexuality and used that to excuse you know white men from use that as an excuse um uh, for to explain why white men you know did engage in interracial sex which was which was talked about as though it was taboo but of course happened with such with such frequency that you know it was not as it might have been considered taboo but not taboo enough to actually you know curb many people's behavior you know so you know there you know women do talk about you know being mindful of where they would go not trying to not trying to find themselves in spaces where they would be alone with men with with um with white men in particular if they could help that again not trying to again do things that could be perceived as sexual you know interestingly enough i you know i can recall two pieces of evidence uh where where white women actually disfigure enslaved women because they perceive that their hu- that their husbands are drawn to this woman's beauty and that their husbands have brought this woman into their home because they do intend to have sexual relations with her and so you know these are instances that of these women were their response to their husbands actions are to you know do things like cut, you know in one instance the 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 slave um the slave holding woman grabs the pair, when her husband leaves she grabs a pair of scissors and grabs this woman by the hair and and she's described by um the enslaved witness who tells the story you know as having light skin as having long straight hair and 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 they even describe her themselves as being you know pretty and how and they and and they speak to the fact that they know that his his wife has made, taken notice of this and so when her husband leaves she grabs a pair of scissors and grabs a woman by the hair and cuts all of her hair off you know like down to the scalp as to rob her of what she thinks her husband might see and even that woman herself might see as a feature of beauty and so you know whether we want to see that as an act of revenge on behalf of a jealous wife um or as you know just sending a message you know to her husband who claimed that he brought the woman there to be her seamstress and she and, and that's her way of saying you know i know you didn't bring this woman here to be my seamstress you know it, it's it's her it was her way of acknowledging i mean i think i think it's a combination of those things actually it's you know it's about um inserting herself power you know inserting her own power in that inst- in that instance and, and um and yeah in an attempt to disfigure this woman um 
to try to, you know, thwart her husband's scheme. On that latter point, we interviewed Stephanie Jones Rogers, who, as you probably know, authored a book on white women as slave owners. And the question arises in the context of your book, to what extent were white women complicit uh, in these episodes, either in terms of what you just described or in terms even of sexually abusing enslaved women themselves? I mean, I, w I would say that, you know, these, you know, white women were very complicit, uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's important. It's important to to think about infrastructures when we think about power. You know, there's there's levels, there's levels to power. And so while, you know, this, you know, the antebellum South was a cis, you know, op, you know, perpetuated, um, you know, a power system that subjugated blackness to whiteness. It was also a, a system that subjugated women to men. And so, you know, they're, you know, these women, you know, they often, they found themselves in situations where, you know, even if they found discomfort or they were displeased with the fact that their husbands or sons or, you know, brothers or fathers were engaging in, you know, long-term relationships or, you know, e you know, acts of sexual violence against enslaved women, they, they did not, you know, they were not outwardly expected to express that discomfort or to, you know, they, you know, they also had a role to play in the society. And as the, as the legal guardian, I mean, as the legal subjects of men, you know, so this is a society where, men had guard legal guardianship over women and children and so you know as a wife you you were this your husband was your legal guardian and you were you know you were his subject and so you know they they didn't necessarily find themselves in a position where they you know they they were expected not to you know not to really um to speak out against this system to have to have an opinion you know and they are taught that you know this is this is a part this is just a part of of life you know even if you don't like it it just you're expected to turn a blind eye and so what we often see is that you know though they had that, that expectation it didn't mean that they didn't have feelings about it and so they're complicit in that you know they you know they don't you know they don't you know, come together in solidarity and, you know, with enslaved people and, you know, raise arms against um, these, you know, these men who are, you know, creating these vicious acts, um, but they're complicit in their, in, in, in their silence. Um, but again, I think it's important to note that that's what was expected of them. Now, I think, you know, where I think what's, what is interesting is that when they do decide to act out, when they do decide to, you know, raise their voice, when they do decide to even raise their hand in, you know, to act violently, it's often against the the enslaved. It's often against the enslaved women themselves. And it's and that's because they are the they are the ones in this system who they have power over. And so that's how they're able to air out their frustrations. That's how they're able to, um, you know, in in their minds, perhaps, you know, shape these situations that, you know, there's a there's a thought that, you know, if, if I can beat this woman and she can stop doing the thing that's drawing my husband's attention, you know, if I beat her enough, then then maybe she will she'll take that as a warning and she'll try to avoid him when he when he calls for her and you know and, and there's definitely ways in which you know we can say that that's again that's illogical you know i mean i think that these women you know they knew that these enslaved women were not the ones initiating you know these these moments of 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 sexual contact you know they they know that but this is i think 
you know, acting violently against these women is, you know, is how they is how they choose is how they're choosing to cope, how they're choosing to exercise agency because it's it's what's accessible to them. Finally, Shannon C. Eves, author of the book Sexual Violence in American Slavery, in the subtitle of your book is the phrase rape culture. Uh, can you talk to us about what contemporary echoes do you sense with regard to the history you've excavated? You know, it's, you know, the, you know, when, when I think about rape culture as a term, you know, this is a, this is a very contemporary, this is a contemporary term. Um, it's, it's not a term that people during the antebellum period would have used but you know when i think about how theorists today describe a rape culture you know th this time period you know definitely has all of the has all of the elements of of what makes what makes for rape culture and so you know it it is it you know because it it is my attempt to to draw connections when we think about yeah, I would say, you know, in our current, in our, in our, in our contemporary landscape, you know, I, I, I'm, I most often think about college campuses, you know, being, you know, being a, a professor on a college campus, I'm very much aware of the fact that college campuses do, do, do often facilitate and create a cultural landscape where women and other vulnerable groups are very they're vulnerable and often subjected to to acts of violence and you know one in four you know we know that at the very least one in four college age women you know will you know will be a victim of of sexual assault and there's and there's so many aspects of like a college campus that that lend to that, um, you know, just even thinking about, you know, part, you know, party culture and um, and drinking and, and and alcohol and 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 just the fact that we still very much live in a society that that says that you know boys will be boys and 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 so I think that you know there's there's a way in which young women on college campuses you know th it, this is a rape culture because they have they have the understanding that they could be victims of sexual assault and they are forced to navigate that space in a particular way you know when we bring freshmen to to and and, and and there's ways in which, you know, we can clearly identify it as a rape culture because there's ways in which we prepare students for it, you know, and, and we acknowledge the, in our preparation acknowledges the fact that, you know, that, that women are the primary victims of the system. You know, we, we tell young women on college campuses, you know, not to go places at night by themselves, you know, and, and so there's... And if they do, and if they then become a victim of sexual assault, you know, then there's the questions of, and this is the perpetuation of the rape culture, right? The question is not, the question then becomes, well, why didn't you follow the rules? You know, why didn't you, you know, take heed to the advice? Perhaps if you had, then, you know, this might not have happened to you, right? And, and so... That, that's how cultures work. There's expectations, there's prescriptions, there's ways that people are supposed to behave. There's, and, um, and so, you know, that's most, you know, you know, when we, you know, when we think often about rape cultures in, in our country, you know, like I said, college, the college campus is, is the one that primarily comes to mind. But, but when I think about that, it, it reminds me, it, it does make me think so much about the same sorts of things that enslaved women were told and things that enslaved women had to navigate. And, and so I hope that people will, will see that, you know, in order for us, they'll see rape culture in a contemporary sense as 
an extension of of the of the antebellum period of the very founding of our country that sexual violence sexual exploitation has always been a part of our nation's history that you know we did not all of a sudden you know you know we didn't just all of a sudden create a cultural landscape where you know women often find themselves you know, walking to their car briskly at night with their keys in their hand, you know, and having to think about on a daily basis, you know, how they can maneuver certain spaces in order to avoid, um, you know, sexual violence. That this is a long, this is a long standing history. And it's one that doesn't just fall at the along gender lines but it that it often has manifested itself at the intersection of race and gender and that historically that there has been no group that has been more terrorized by sexual violence in this country than women of african descent Hmm. well i'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there Shannon C. Eves, assistant professor of history college of charleston in south carolina author of the book Sexual Violence in American Slavery. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. Thank you so much. For KPFK Pacifica Radio, this is Gerald Horn for Freedom Now, urging you to go to our secure website at kpfk.org and make a secure pledge to make sure that the valuable information that you receive on a weekly basis on Freedom Now continues. Where else but Freedom Now can you receive detailed information on the struggle for reparations of descendants of enslaved Africans or the prison industrial complex or the continuing hard legacy of enslavement or the glories of victories over white supremacy and colonialism and imperialism. Where else but freedom now do you get such information along with the hippest music mix in North America, including the work of John Coltrane, Alice Coltrane, Pharaoh Sanders, McCoy Tyner, Regina Carter, and Esperanza Spaulding, amongst others. At Freedom Now, we take special pride in our program concerning black women's struggles in particular, making us unique on the airwaves. So pick up the phone and dial. 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-KPFK. What a difference a half dozen makes. The war against Gaza has entered now its sixth month, and no end is in sight. Over 33,000 souls, men, women, and children, are dead. Thousands of housing units have been destroyed, and millions of Palestinians are facing imminent famine and utter starvation. Notice I said the war against Gaza instead of war against Hamas, an Islamist resistance organization. Why did I say this? Because the vast majority of the dead are non-combatants. Thousands were children. Are we to believe they were Hamas babies? The hatred Israelis feel towards Arabs in general and Palestinians in particular, are beyond the pale. But this conflict is more than racist and more than merely political. It is both existential and territorial. It is a settler colonial conflict that covets the land of Palestinians. It could care less for the people. Doesn't that explain the naked carnage of the war? 
Doesn't that explain the average of 5,000 deaths per month? One need look no further than the IDF's killing of three shirtless Jewish hostages speaking Hebrew. As the saying goes, shoot first, ask questions later. If you're in the territory, your target, and then the killing of seven World Central Kitchen helpers happens, and liberals go bonkers. Israel gets wraps on its knuckles. Bad dog, bad dog. Really? Really? Some 33,000 Palestinians get slaughtered and the virtual silence is deafening. Dr. Franz Fanon, in his classic work, The Wretched of the Earth, said that colonial conflicts are between two different species. Colonizers are deemed human. The colonized are less than human. For being unfree, they are non-human because only humans are free. Liberals call for a ceasefire. Why not go to the core of things by demanding an end to occupation? Don't Palestinians deserve freedom? Don't Palestinians deserve a right to exist? Don't Palestinians deserve statehood? Or are these things only for Israelis? Perhaps I'm not being fair. Perhaps. But then I think of the words of an Israeli diplomat, the ambassador who was discussing peace with Palestine. Danny Denon, Israel's UN ambassador, in an op-ed piece for the June 24, 2019 edition of the New York Times, wrote that Palestinians need only do two things to establish peace. A, commit his words, national suicide and B, surrender. Think of that. A French imperial colonial couldn't have said it better. The U.S. is not a fair nor impartial arbiter. It is deeply biased in arms of apartheid Israel with weapons, not of defense, but of offense. The IDF stands for the Israeli death force. So let us begin with a call. Cease the occupation with love, not fear. This is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Prison Radio. And in closing, we would like to thank all who contributed this hour, our guests, our contributors and producers, Dr. Shannon Eve, Sister Nikki Okuk, Debbie Nguare, Dr. Gerald Horn, Sister Flora, Sister Femi, Brother Brandon, our board op Wendell, and production support Mark Maxwell. Stay tuned for more Fun Drive programming. Signing off for Freedom Now, this is Sister Thage, and until next week, as always, we stand ready for revolution. <laughs>